How many of you remember growing up <clears throat> as kids, there was typically a neighborhood store close by that you would walk to. And I remember even back in the days when we would pick up, um, I called them Coke bottles. I mean, you know, a lot of people called them soda bottles, pop bottles. And you'd take them into the store little neighborhood store and you'd trade them in and get some candy stuff like that <clears throat> well I have I have a little story for you this morning about a little girl she'd been really good and her dad gave her two dollars and he said look you can do whatever you want to do with one dollar but then come Sunday I want you to give the other dollar to God she said that's great, Daddy. That's just wonderful. And so she headed down to the local neighborhood store just with all kinds of visions going on in her head about what she was going to buy, what kind of candy she was going to be able to get for a dollar. She was just skipping along, just having the best time, and as she got close to the store, and her skipping kind of got away with her just a little bit, and she tripped and fell. One of the dollars got loose and the wind caught it, <clears throat> blew it into the storm drain. Well, she got up and dusted herself off. And, and she looked at that dollar she held tightly in her hand. And she looked at that storm drain. And then she said, Well, Jesus, there goes your dollar. And you know, so many, <laughs> so many Christians have that same attitude about, about uh, giving. You know, first comes me and what I deem to be the most important things in my life, and then comes God with whatever's left. Well, we're going to finish chapter 12 of Mark today, and we're going to get into a little bit of this, and as we get down into it, I'm going to bring some things to your attention, and I don't want you to read any more into the text than is really there, because the, this particular text is used by all kinds of, of evangelists and pastors and others to uh, say this, that, or the other about your giving habits. Um, but I'm going to share with you exactly what Jesus is revealing to us today and then a couple of points of application that I think we can carry away from this. If you remember back with me, last week Jesus was continuing to teach in the courts, the courtyards of the temple, and he was trying to get the folks there to see the connection between the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, um, that that. The Messiah was not only man, but also God. And of course, it just went right over the top of their heads. They didn't, didn't catch it at all. Today, Jesus is going to finish his last public teaching slash preaching to the crowds. And from now on, he's going to be just concentrating on the disciples only as he prepares them for what is to come in the next few days. So let's read the scripture text today. This is Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. Mark 12, verses 38 through 44. And um, I'm going to read the text today uh, just because it's a little bit long. <clears throat> um, next week we will uh, come back with, with you guys helping me read this. But uh, verses 38 through 44. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put into uh, put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this, is po this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, 
all she had to live on. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord's blessing on this. Father God, we just we pour out our hearts today that you would show us uh, this this lesson that you would instill in us what it is that we need to do in order to in order to move a little bit closer in our worship to you, in order to see things a little bit uh, more clearly as we uh, as we continue in this journey of Passion Week. And Father, we give you praise and glory and honor for everything that would be accomplished this day in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. So Jesus is calling out the scribes again, and I call them the great pretenders. I don't know if you remember that song or not. It's quite, I was going to say old. It's been around for a while. Um, anyway, the, I call them the great pretenders, and, and this is the last section of Scripture in Mark 12, and um, I, we need to talk a little bit about this religious group because Jesus calls them out. Uh, rebuking them and warning the people there to be be beware of them and remember he is he is uh, moving around in the courtyards of the temple all day. This is Wednesday of Passion Week all day and preaching and teaching and these large crowds are following him around and you know that there are some scribes there and he calls them out in front of them to all of these people be aware of the scribes and he lays out why. And so just to, to, to kind of make things a little bit clear, in Judaism there was, there was this, this council, this overarching council called the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was made up of 70 people, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, elders, um, and uh, the chief priests. So I guess that would be a total of 71 uh, made up the Sanhedrin. And, and they were the supreme council, if you will, that governed all of the affairs of the people, religious and otherwise. They governed all of the affairs of the people, of the Jewish people. And <clears throat> the scribes in particular were Pharisees that studied the law. They were experts in the law. They knew it inside and out, and they uh, dictated to people, uh, the Jewish people by and large, and then uh, leaders as well, what the law was saying, what it meant. They interpreted it with regards to their everyday lives. This is what the law says. This is what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to live your life out. In the beginning, the scribes were these, these, these religious leaders who were to be trusted. I mean, you, you trusted them with guiding your everyday life. And, and you would expect them to tell you exactly how to live that life rightly with regard to the law. But over time, they became this, this, this group of pompous leaders who be, really honestly and truly, they became more concerned about their own celebrity status than doing the right thing for the people and making sure that they understood how to live life in the right way. Now, as a part of this religious system, the scribes were not given a salary. They weren't supposed to make money off of the religious system. And so over time... Uh, again, they became very creative in how they could make money and support their luxurious lifestyles. We're talking about the scribes here, the scribes who are supposed to be experts in the law. You know, m m most of what they did to make money was along the lines of selling their services. They were like today's attorneys. And so they would go to people, and uh, they would instruct them with regard to the law, uh, how to live life and what to do to secure this and secure that and all that kind of good stuff and they would get kind of paid on the side. But they became very creative with the way that they did that. Now, in the system, in the system, just like the system today, they were viewed as, as devout, as uh, godly, as, as, as holy, and they were viewed and, and respected as, re as being responsible with dictating to these people how they should live their lives. They were what you would consider to be the shepherds of Israel from the perspective of God's people. And they wanted to be seen as the shepherd of God's people. So they did everything they could do to elevate themselves so that they um, could satisfy, if you will, their, their craving for popularity and, and for power and prestige and, and for money. So you have then these leaders of the Jewish people 
um, who pretend to worship God. They pretend to serve God. They pretend to honor God in the way that they live their lives. Um, they pretend to lead people into, into God's will for their lives uh, when actually what they're doing is, is they're, they're producing people who are far away from God. As a matter of fact, uh, I believe it's Matthew chapter 23. Uh, they're called the sons of hell, and they're creating sons of hell because they're leading people away from what they should be really doing. Uh, and, and honestly and truly, you know, if you look at it where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, they hated Jesus. And so, the, the, you know, they were against God. And anything against God is going to be of Satan. And they allowed Satan to use them uh, to move the people away from God. It's, it's a false religion. Enemies of Christ, enemies of the truth, enemies of the gospel. And so in Mark 12, 38, it says in in his teaching, he said, beware of the scribes. Beware of the scribes. And I was thinking as I read through that, uh-oh, Houston, we got a problem. Jesus is saying, beware of the scribes. And, and, and he, these are the people who are supposed to be your leaders. They're supposed to be giving you direction of how to live your life. They're, respo they're responsible with the law telling you how to, to live your life. And, and now Jesus comes out and he says, beware of the scribes. You know, and so it basically it comes down to this. You have to protect yourself from those hypocrites because they're selling them out. They tended to trust people because, you know, uh, th there were no other options. You either trusted the scribes with what they told you or get in trouble. They were, they were unfortunately just kind of sucked into this, this false religion. And now Jesus is saying, hold up. You need to be aware of these scribes and what they're doing. The second part of verse 38 says, beware of the scribes who walk around in long robes. Now let me ex explain these robes to you. These robes were very expensive scribal robes that go all the way down to the ground. Very expensive. And back in, in Numbers 15, we find that they're supposed to have little blue tassels on the bottom of their robe. But now over time, over centuries, uh, the scribes began to look at those little tassels as, as being uh, items of prominence showing their glory and their status and, and how they were elevated. And so over the centuries, over time, they began making those tassels a little bit longer and a little bit longer and a little bit longer, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and, and there's no telling how big and large they are now. Dragging the ground so that whenever they're seen out, people know exactly who they are, right? There's no doubt. I guess, you know, it was the kind of thing where it was like, it's all about me. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Kind of a thing. The next thing it says in the last part of verse 38 is, and like greetings in the marketplaces. So, so they, they moved about in public life with, with this special one-of-a-kind robe, uh, you know, that, that is just very expensive, very elaborate with these long, big tassels on it so that people would see them and they would um, know exactly who they, they were, but they would address them with these, these titles. You know, uh, some of the titles, let's see, um, some of the titles they had were like uh, rabbi, which means teacher, exalted one, uh, actually kind of means like, you know, one who is studied like a doctor or, or some other kind of exalted teacher, uh, the most knowledgeable one, great one. They, they had this, this air of, of uh, being elevated above the, the rest of the people, and that's the kind of titles that they were expecting people to have as they saw them out walking around. 
And you know that they were so exalted in their own minds over the, the rest of the people that uh, it, was, it would bring you more harm to go against something the scribe said than it would be to go against something Scripture said. You know, because the scribes could fight back. Scripture wouldn't fight back, but the scribes would. They would come after you. And then it says in the first part of verse 39, and have the best seats in the synagogues. Have the best seats in the synagogues. So the, the way that the synagogues were laid out is, is much like the way we have things today. You know, there, there, was, there was typically a chess or a case or something that would, that would hold the scriptures that had the, the scrolls in them. And then there were seats that were on the platform, if there was a platform, or behind the person speaking. And these seats would be facing this way. And you would be looking directly at them as they sat and they looked at you all decked out and everything. And they, they had this need almost that they would sit in, in these synagogues in the best seats. The second part of verse 39 says, And they loved the places of honor at feasts. And so you have a host is giving a feast, and the scribes wanted to be on the right and the left of the host. They wanted to be seen as being prominent, as being, you know, a person of prestige, and they had fallen to, to this, 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 this thing of power and prestige and pride had gotten them. The verse part of verse 40 then comes and says, who devour widows' houses. And as I was reading through this, I could see all of the other things that would make them pompous, that would make them um, arrogant, uh, where they tried to elevate themselves above the people and that kind of stuff. But then you come down to this, and this is just awful, just absolutely awful. They devour widows' houses. They're supposed to be the shepherds of the sheep. They're supposed to be the ones leading the people to protect them. And yet they were taking advantage of the widows. Now, James tells us what? James tells us that pure religion is taking care of the orphans and widows, doesn't he? But the scribes are completely different from that. I mean, they, they should have known the Old Testament, and you can start back in Exodus chapter 22 and go through Deuteronomy and all the way up to Malachi chapter 3, and you can see all kinds of places that, that tell us in the Old Testament to take care of the widows. Take care of the widows. And so what were these men doing? They were basically consuming everything that the widows had. And, and the, the word actually literally means to eat them up. They, they would plunder them. And this is how, kind of how they would do it. They would go into the widows, especially as they started getting older, and they would sell their services as, as an attorney, so to speak, to make sure that the, the house and all of their holdings were safe and secure. And then, regardless if they had children or not, whenever the widow passed away, the scribe would have worked things out so that the house would be deeded to them. Along the way, as they provided the services to the widows, then they would pay themselves. And along the way, some of the widows needed a little help, and so the scribes would just kind of move in and leech off of the widows. And it's all a matter of money. That's all it was. They were just taking advantage of these widows. Even more so, whenever the widows would get older and their minds would start slipping a little bit, then they would just basically come in and take over and have everything deeded over to them. And so they gave direction to everybody, not only just the widows, that you have to come to the temple to the court of women where we have 13 offering receptacles to bring your money, your offering. The whole system was built on the fact that you needed to bring your money to the temple. And basically the way that they were selling it, as I understand, was you bring your money, you put it in the offering box, and that 
in turn brings you redemption, brings you salvation. So see, if you want to be in good standings with God and do the things that a good little Jewish person would do, then you're going to bring your money. That's the way that the whole system worked. And then lastly, it says uh, these great pretenders who pray long prayers in the second part of verse 40. And for a pretense, make long prayers. In other words, just for the sake of appearances, they would make long prayers. And they, they really don't want to talk to God. They really don't have anything to say to God. It's all for an appearance. It's all for a pretense. They're, they're doing it so that they look righteous and they look holy in, the, in the, the light of what they're doing to the people around them. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said that these, these prayers are characterized by endless and vain repetition, just on and 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 on it would go. Vain repetition. You know, and uh, you still find a lot of that uh, today. And honestly and truly, uh, you know, sometimes my witness does, doesn't bear witness with their spirit, and and uh, it's like a sham. I mean, it's you can tell that it's it's a sham. And it's just for an appearance. The last part of verse 40 gives us the judgment for the great pretenders. And so Jesus cautions and characterizes these scribes and then he condemns them by saying they will receive the greater condemnation. Now, just let me say this. Uh, Even in today's churches, there are those people who come to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And if you were to ask them, um, are you going to heaven? They would tell you yes. Oh, why are you going to, how do you know you're going to heaven? Because I'm a good religious person. Because uh, I went with mom and daddy whenever I was growing up. And um, they had a good church. Because, 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 because. But they never really get down to the nitty-gritty of why they are assured salvation because of their trust in Jesus, right? They just, they just circle around, circle around, and circle around it. I honestly believe that there is going to be a substantial pocket of individuals in a deep, hot part of hell who considered themselves to be religious people and who led many other people astray because of that attitude. And I think that, that these people are going to be there as well. These teachers, these false teachers, and, 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 and these agents of Satan. If you're against God, then you're, you're for Satan. There's just... You can't ride the fence with that. And I think there are going to be a lot of people there who over the years thought that they lived a good life that would lead them to heaven. But now we come down to this part where Jesus begins to um, watch, if you will, just to step back a little bit and watch the activity going on in the court of women around the offering receptacles. He's just taking note of things, you know, and at this juncture, he's done with his public ministry. He's not going to be preaching or teaching anymore to the public right now. From here on out, he's only concerned with the disciples and what's, what they're going to have to, 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 to come against in the days to come and the, and the days after that. He's preparing them to get ready for what is going to happen, how things are going to wind up. And so he's been moving around the temple just like rabbis do back in the day. And he'd be over here in this port of call and then be over here in this one. And then now he's in the court of women and he's just kind of sitting back and he's watching things going on. And he notices um, uh, observing people coming and putting in their offering. 
And he sees in verse 41, he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. So the first thing that Jesus observes is, is rich people coming around, putting in large sums of money into the offering receptacles. And you would expect that. You, you, you would expect that, right? People with means do so, um, and they probably put in uh, you know, a much larger percentage of their income uh, in the form of tithes and offerings than other people. And you would, that's just something that you would expect. They have the means to do that. And if, especially if they're, uh, if they're a Christian and they're trying to, to follow the commandments of the New Testament for us, then they're going to want to support the church. And, and, and that's what you would expect. And they can do it without worrying about, you know, whether or not I'm going to be able to afford lunch today at Don Pepe's. All right? But then... This poor widow comes up. She shows up and she puts in her offering. In verse 42 it says, And a poor widow came up and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. Now, I don't want you to read anything into verse 41 and 42 that is, is not there. Okay? Because a lot, of people, a lot of people do. A lot of people use this section of the book of Mark to, to say all kinds of things. The first thing that I don't want you to read into verse 41 is that, is that it is a sin for a person to put in large sums of money into the offering plate. Scripture doesn't say that. It's not a sin for somebody to put in a lot of money in the church. Another thing that it does not say is, it, it does not say in Scripture in uh, verse 41 that uh, people who put in large sums of money are more religious than people who don't. Nor does it say in verse 42 that people who put in everything they got are more religious than other people. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that at all. And on top of that, neither of these verses say anything about giving a tithe. They don't say anything about giving 10% of your income. It doesn't, doesn't say that. You know, the rich could do that, probably, those with means who can do that, I'm sure do that. The poor, on the other hand, would really struggle with that. And so, what did Jesus actually say about this to his disciples? Well, in verse 43 and 44, he says, And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. So Jesus just simply points out, look, you've got these people, the, 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 the people who have money, the people who have means, are coming and they're giving out of their abundance. They can give large amounts of money to the church without worrying about whether or not they're going to be able to go eat or pay some other bill. It, it, you know, they can do that. It might be more than 10%. It might be less than 10%. You know, I, I don't know. We really don't know. It doesn't tell us. But really and truly, it, it doesn't matter. The statement that Jesus is making here is that the rich gave out of their abundance out of their abundance and had much more left. In other words, they didn't have to worry about, about anything after they gave their offering. They gave large sums of money and had more available to give if they wanted to do so or to help somebody out along the way if they wanted to do so. That's just a blessing that God had given them. But then Jesus also points out that the poor widow gave out of her poverty, out of her poverty. Now, there's... These are two different things. Notice, though, that Jesus did not say that this was the way to give. He did not say that he expected all of us to give all that we have and then to go home with nothing to eat. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. He simply observed 
what the widow did, right? She gave everything she had. The scripture said all she had to live on. So at the end of the day, she didn't have enough money to go pay for her next meal. And, and just so you know, don't be taken by the, word, the, the use of the word penny. If you do the math and you know what the copper coins represent as far as a denarius is concerned, a denarius is, the, is the, uh, a daily wage for a person working. If you take that fraction and you take today's minimum wage, you know that that's going to be about payment for 15 to 20 minutes of work, what she had to put in. That's going to be the equivalent of like $1.50 to $2, something like that. That's all she had. She gave that money, and she didn't have enough money for the next meal. And, and so what does, that, what does that mean? How, how do we tie these these two sections together. How do we tie the section of the scribes that Jesus just lowers the boom on them with this section? Well, it's because of what Jesus says about the scribes and how they devour the houses of the widows. And now you have this widow showing up thinking that she has to give everything she has probably because... A scribe somewhere told her that. Doesn't say anything about how religious she is. Doesn't say anything about her wanting to, you know, uh, wanting to love God or, or anything else. Honestly and truly, she shows up as a victim. As a victim. A victim to this religious system that is taking all of their money their houses, and all kinds of other things that is dictating over them this lordship in order that they can stay in control and control the people. As Jesus put it, this has truly become a den of robbers. And so I looked at this and I thought, well, okay, I see what's going on and I see how Jesus... Jesus is, is tying all this together, trying to make these people understand what kind of system they're dealing with. I don't think they're getting it, and we'll see later that they don't get it. But for us, what kind of application can we carry out of this? What does this mean for us today? And I think there are a couple of points of application that I want to share with you here. In the New Testament, time and time again, we're commanded to give to the church and to God's work in general. We're, we're, we're commanded to, to, to uh, take care of others who have needs. The widows and the orphans, as James puts it. We're to have a compassionate heart toward others who need something. Now, nowhere in the New Testament does it say uh, 10%. It doesn't say that. Right, but we're commanded to give. Now, what I would say is the amount that you and your family give to the church is between you and God, and you need to pursue God and find out what that is and then be obedient to that and give that. You should always be praying about what God would have you to do and be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit in that because God can use you in the practice of giving. That's the first thing. But the second thing is to give sacrificially. Now, comparatively speaking, between the rich people and the widow, she did give more sacrificially than the rich people did. She gave everything she had. For whatever reason, which we really don't know, that's what she did. And so I think the second point is this, that we should give sacrificially. Does that mean that we're supposed to give everything we have? No, it, that, that's, that's not what it means. That's not what it means at all. But it means that, that we should give in such a way that there is a sacrifice involved in our giving. Now, 
let me give you an illustration. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stretch this illustration just a little bit to make a point. And for those of you that have been with us for a while, you know where I'm coming from and uh, where I'm going. So the illustration is this. Let's say that I have a great need to replace a car that I've been driving for a very long time that had over 400,000 miles on it, right? And God just wonderfully blessed me with the means to go buy a Ferrari. Now, I went big for the, to, to make the point, okay? I went big on that one to make, to make the point. Do I need a Ferrari, especially in Mount Pleasant? Where I wouldn't even be able to get from one red light to the other without getting out of first gear? No. I wouldn't even be able to drive it on the bypass without getting a ticket. So I don't need a Ferrari. What do I need? Well, I need, I need a pretty, pretty good used Toyota Corolla. It's got a few miles on it, you know. And great on gas. All oh, the gas mileage is phenomenal. That's what I need. So I go out and I buy this Toyota Corolla. But I've got all of this money left over that God blessed me with that I could have gone and got a Ferrari. So instead of buying the Ferrari, I buy the Toyota, and I give that money to the church. woo -hoo! Wouldn't that be awesome? That's what I mean. Right? But then there, there are going to be those people that say, oh, but Pastor Tim, um, that's my money. That's my money, and I, I want to spend it the way that I want to spend it. You know, God blessed me with all of this money. I could have gone and gotten a Ferrari. I could have blown all that money on a Ferrari, but I'm not going to do that. I, I'm going to go buy a Toyota Corolla, but, but that means I can go buy all kinds of other things. Well, you know what? It, it's not really as much your money as you think it's your money. And, and, and I'm going to say, I'm going to say this, God is sovereign over all things, right? He, he just is. That's just who God is. God is sovereign over you getting up every day. He is sovereign over your ability to make a living, feast or famine. He is sovereign over that. If he blesses you with the means to make a good living for your family, that's a blessing from God. And so as Jesus said, we need to give back to God what is God's. Is that 10%? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know what, what God has in store for you. I don't know what God is going to ask you to do. But you need to go and find out what that is. So in closing, let me leave you with this. Every day, every day, regardless of what goes on, and this week is going to be crazy, folks. This, this week, next week, the rest of January is going to be absolutely nuts. There's no telling what we're going to get into in February and March. I, I, there's just even no, there's no way of even speculating. But every day that you get up, know this. God has bestowed upon you blessings. Blessings. Even when it looks gloom and doom, there are blessings that God has given you. Be aware of those blessings, including your ability to make a living. Give back to God what is God's. Even if it's adjusted on a daily basis, give back to God what is His. And, and, and the Bible tells us it should be the first fruit, so to speak. In other words, give back to God what is his and then worry about everything else. I, 
I, I've, I've told you before, God has proven this in our life so many times. So many times. If you do that, then your washing machine and your dryer run for 18, 20 years. <laughs> if you do that, you have lawnmowers that the wheels are about to fall off, but they're still on there and they still cut. If you do that, you drive a Saturn over 400,000 miles. That's just God. That's just God. And his blessings for being obedient. So, please spend time in the days and the weeks and the months to come checking in on a regular basis, praying about what God would have you to do how God would want you to give. And that's not only finances, but how God would want to give of your time, your talents, and other things to be a blessing to other people. Would you do that? I think we need to concentrate on that going into this year and not so much about what's going on around us because we're called to be light, and we're called to be the church. All right, let's bow our heads and we'll come to a close. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this, this time of being in your word. We thank you for uh, this section of scripture as we close out chapter 12 and, and what this really means, Father God. We, we, we thank you for the challenge of looking at uh, our relationship with you and understanding that you are sovereign over all of things in our life, including our ability to make a living so, Father, right now, I just I, I want to I want to take a moment and I want to stop and I want to say thank you. I want to thank you, Father, for the way that you've blessed us. I want to thank you, Father, for the way that you continue to bless us. I want to thank you for your mercy, for your kindness, your compassion. I want to thank you for your grace that you have extended to us, grace upon grace that you have extended to us. Now, Father, there are things in our life that we don't understand. And Satan comes against us, sometimes on a daily basis, to try to chop our legs out from under us, to try to take our eyes off of you and put them on something else that is, is to potentially over time replace you. And Father, don't let that happen. I pray that you would reinforce in us right now your presence in our lives. I pray that you would enable us to see your great and mighty hand and your hand of protection over us especially now and in the days to come. Father God, I lift up those that are in our congregation today that are self-quarantining, that you would touch them, that you would heal them, that you would bless them at this moment, at this time, with a special touch, that you would, that you would move them past any kind of, of viral infections. I pray that you would continue to bless this church and grow this church up to be a concern in this community that we can continuously point to you as the sovereign God of the universe, the creator of all things, the giver of life, the giver of eternal life. And with that, Father, we just offer this up to you. Again, a sweet-smelling incense that we hope you will receive and it be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.